Check those clocks. Maybe you've been checking every day. Maybe you've been checking every day for like 90 days and you're like, when is it going to be? When is it going to be a time to think? Today is that day, Josh. And you've chosen like we have to not think for the past 90 days. Correct. We've been in stasis. And we're all dumber for it. Correct. Congratulations. We have been awarded no points. <laughs> <laughs> and if you get that reference, uh, then uh, that's a pastoral trick I've learned, Chris, is you just, you reference the movie without saying the name of the movie, yeah. and then if someone else knows the reference, then you're both condemned. Yeah, there you go. You know. <laughs> but of course, we know that none of us stand condemned in Christ. We are pastors, as, uh, as it were. Pastor Chris. Yeah, that's pastors me. Pastors of the church in Stevens Point with Con- Wisconsin. With Wisconsin. With Wisconsin. Pastor Josh usually can speak when he bastards a church. In Wathaw. In Wathaw, <laughs> Wathaw Wisconsin. Uh, together we combine forces, we touch signet rings, and we uh, have a podcast called A Time to Think. We just haven't really had a normal week schedule in quite some time. No, it's it's been an interesting summer. You've been doing a lot of stuff. I mean, you've been down in uh, Florida. You've right. been enjoying the uh, Reformed Theological Seminary yes. environs in Orlando. Um, it just and, happened to be that it seemed like the weeks you were available on a Monday, yeah. I wasn't, and then vice yeah. versa. You've been up to Packers training camp. Yeah, fun time and, there. Fun so there were just, there. you know, you had a class, I think, and just every week. Yep, my last like, well, intensive. Maybe we should yep. record a podcast. And mm-hmm. I think we left off in May sometime saying, hey, we're going to talk about the canon. And yeah. then it was like crickets. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you've been pining after our sultry, smooth voices, mm. sultry is probably a bad thing to say. <laughs> smooth. We'll go with smooth. Um, here, we're back. And we're going to start with just kind of like a, what you've been up to podcast. Yeah. Why? Where have because you been clearly this you are all wondering what we've been up to. You love us. You desire to hear what's going on in our lives. I mean, we're a meaningful part of your regular uh, schedules and agendas, I'm sure. I mean, Josh, would you say that's probably accurate? For most people listening right now, That's, they are deeply desirous of what's happening in our lives to, to know about these things. You know what I've learned from you, Chris? That sounds a little self-aggrandizing. But what I have learned from Chris is <laughs> relationality is quite beneficial in ministry. Yeah, that's true. And so for that's a guy true. like myself who tends to be business first, tends to be, you know. If, you're, you're, the, you're a mullet guy. You have business up front. But there is party, party in the back. Yeah. In the back. Exactly. So this is really my attempt to be more like Chris and to lead with party up front, party in the back. Yeah, yeah. Just no business at party, all. Party, That's, party, party. Yeah. So I have very simple questions, and I think they go something like this: uh, What you've been doing? That's you know a little slang. What you've been doing? What mm-hmm. you've been learning? What you've been preaching? Mm-hmm. What you've been thinking? So yeah. that last one, I just kind of want to talk like it could be. I thought we were thinking about nothing. Right, since our last podcast, we haven't taken a time to think. I have known you long enough to know that you are incapable of thinking of nothing. <sighs> yeah. You know the same about me. That is correct. So that could go any number of directions. It could be I've been thinking about football. It could be I've been thinking about the election. I mean, it could be any number of things, but just kind of ending the podcast by saying, when you found yourself thinking, what do you think yeah. about? But let's start with what, it, what have you been doing? What's summer been like for you, Chris? Um, yeah, I mean, you had mentioned I, I had my last intensive, so uh, my doctoral program is nearing uh, conclusion this next year, Lord willing, and we'll, we'll have that finished up. So I have my last class with uh, Dr. Oren Martin, who's down at uh, a, a, the Pastor for Theology, effectively, at a large church in uh, the Dallas area. Uh, he is a uh, pastor at the church that Shane and Shane go mm. to, and uh, Shane. That they lead Shane's worship word. down there, and so it's encouraging. Regular you know, listeners of the podcast. Yeah, I'm not, not sure, sure they are. <laughs> but no, it's, you know, it was encouraging to, to kind of get that little bit of insight that here couple of guys that are highly influential in the world of worship music, and they go to a solid church, and he was very complimentary of their just a faithful attendance in the life of, of uh, Watermark Church down in Dallas. So it was encouraging. Had, had that actually have a little bit of work left to do for that class, so I'll be taking care of that sometime in the next day or two, getting a couple more papers written and, and sent off. But um, yeah, so so that was that. We've, we've spent some time as a family. Um, over in the Green Bay area, we, we go over that neck of the woods to just, you know, kind of get away for a little bit. My parents live uh, close there and about 30 minutes away from Green Bay. So uh, it's an opportunity for us to be, you know, kind of close to home mm-hmm. and kind of far away at the same time. And, yeah. And, um, yeah, so went over there, did Packers training camp twice uh, this summer. That was uh, that was fun. It's just kind of neat for the kids to be around there. Yeah. It's so expensive to get Tickets to see a game, so just to kind of be around in the environment of Lambeau Field and everything is, is cool. 
Yeah, and from an outsider's perspective, uh, you know, Packers training camp, Packers preseason is, is still pretty impressive because yeah. you have so many uh, family tradition fans that can't mm-hmm. make it to a regular game because yeah. of the, the way the season tickets work, either mm-hmm. price-wise or the fact that Lambo is a destination for people to travel to and right. all those things that the preseason actually means a lot yeah. here. Whereas, you know, in, in Nashville, if you have a 65,000-person stadium, you probably got 30,000, sure. 40,000 yep. fans tops yep. if they're excited about the team. In Green Bay, you often pack the stadium for right. preseason and, and Packers training camp. Pack the stadium. Wow. Oh, so oh good. Josh, good job. So good. <laughs> but because it, you know, it, it is a chance for a large family like yours right. to go be in the environment in a way. That, mm-hmm. So that's one thing I appreciate about Packers football is yep. it, 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 the preseason isn't meaningless. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's exactly. still as if I think they have like Packers Family Day. I I never heard of something like yep. that. Yep. And people people show out for that, which is mm-hmm. cool. Yeah, they fill the stadium for family night. It's a it's a big deal. Fireworks and that kind of business. So um yeah, I mean that's that's kind of been the the summer for the most part for us. Nothing super exciting. We're not an exciting family. We don't take big trips places and and uh, I guess we don't really feel the the compulsion to do that. Um it's a uh, I guess for us we enjoy being together, being at home, that kind of a thing and um I think for, boy, Simeon, my son, has started fishing in earnest. So uh, he's 11, and he loves doing nice. that with, uh, with another kid from a, our church. We have a 12-year-old here in Wausau mm-hmm. who's become an expert fisherman. Too. Yeah. So there must be something about that turn. Yep. Like. Yep. And, and PJ, a uh, little shout-out to PJ. PJ's a great kid. Simeon goes fishing with Sounds him like all the time. like a master fisherman. Yeah, yeah, he, he's a Waltonburg, so he's a master of many things. And uh, so PJ, uh, PJ hangs out with Simi, and they go fishing together quite a bit. And, and that's been fun to, to see that as, you know, he's reaching you fish? age. Um, I fish socially. I, I, would, I would say the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. If I'm with someone I like, I'll hold a fishing sure. pole, but, you know, I'm going to have to I'll ask pray them to take a little the fish bit before off. I have to yeah, touch exactly. the fish, you know? It's, <laughs> I am a man in other areas of my life. Yeah. Squirmy things aren't my favorite. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't like killing animals, and, you know, I mean, I, I enjoy eating animals, but uh, I don't kill them, and so, you know, fishing is kind of a fun way to, you know, catch an animal and Without release murder. it. Yeah, exactly, without yeah. killing it, so... Um, but yeah, I I can't think of too much else that really has happened this summer for our so family. The, the summer question will flow naturally, I think, into the second question I had is just you know you you and I are both in um, graduate level program, so you're mm-hmm. in or is is it a doctorate postgraduate? How is that termed? I don't know. Whatever. Call it whatever we're, you we're want. We're in continued yeah. <laughs> education. You for your doctorate of ministry, um, me for my master's of divinity. And uh, so I think the what have you been doing this summer question naturally leads to what are you reading, what are you learning? Yeah, um, what am I reading, what am I learning? I, boy, uh, for a couple weeks there, reading a lot of stuff on uh, uh, covenant theology, dispensational theology, new covenant theology. Um, we, uh, the, the intensive was um, biblical theology in the local church, basically. So um, the, it was technically systematic biblical theology, but the focus really was on biblical theological patterns uh, in, in identifying as a pastor how to um, you know, pull those things out for, for your people. And uh, last paper that I have to write... So I've got a, a book review to do on some from Dr. Tom Schreiner at Southern, and then um, a review... Uh, so there'll be the review, and then there'll be uh, a paper, the research paper, on uh, the theme of suffering servants mm-hmm. in Scripture. There's a biblical theological theme uh, it ties together um, pastoral ministry and prophetic ministry, going back to the Old Testament, that uh, uh, more often than not, uh, those men who are called to serve in that role do not have an easy go at it. So mm-hmm. that's um, that'll kind of be the jumping-off point for me. You know, biblical theology is a broad field uh, for those who are not familiar with it, and, and most people probably aren't. It's tracing how the Bible is held together by certain themes, and uh, a big theme is covenant, and that's something that we you know value and take seriously, seeing how God works throughout history uh, and how He engages with His people, the promises He makes, and uh, what He calls us to, and the promises He makes, and so forth. So, um, so yeah, I mean that's that's kind of what uh, has been on the the radar for me. Um, preached through the book of Titus over the summer, moving into First Timothy, which we're both going to be mm-hmm. preaching now this fall. And uh, Titus was great. It was a good warm-up for for, for for First Timothy in a lot of ways um, because similar content is covered. And, um, yeah, so it's kind of a, a little little dress rehearsal for me, I guess, going into the fall here with a longer book in First Timothy. So 
Yeah, so so biblical theology, we want all of our theology to be biblical in the sense that right. it's, it's rooted <laughs> and founded in God's word, but biblical yeah. theology, as you kind of alluded to, mm-hmm. is a technical term for... It's a discipline, yeah. Yeah, viewing the Bible from Genesis to Revelation as a narrative mm-hmm. that has themes. And so yep. one of the, you know, one of the big ones, we just preached through Revelation, uh, you, you could look at Genesis 1 through 3 and look at uh, a man being united to his wife, mm-hmm. and then you could trace that up until Revelation, sure. where you have a husband united to his bride. Yep. This time, it is not the first man and the first woman, but the second Adam, right. Jesus Christ. Who, and the church. Who did all that Adam did not do and did mm-hmm. not do what Adam did do. Yep. And then offered his perfect life in the place mm-hmm. of his bride to purify her so that he could wed himself yep. to her and she could be naked and unashamed once yep. more. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you could... If you ask the question, what does the Bible say about marriage? That's mm-hmm. a systematic theological question. You're kind of mm-hmm. looking at it. Maybe encyclopedia is a bad word to use, but kind of that way, it's like a reference book. What does the Bible say about marriage? Okay, what says this about marriage, this about marriage, this Mm -hmm. about marriage. If you're asking, how does marriage fit into the narrative of the Bible? That's a biblical theological question, right? And, um, you know, you'll you'll hear a lot of biblical theology from Chris and I, even if we don't use those words, because one of the things we want you to see is that uh, the Bible, written 66 different books, written by what 40 some odd authors over thousands of years is a story. Yeah. And it's not a story in the same way that we look at like Thomas the Tank Engine as a story Mm -hmm. that's written for entertainment. It's a story in the sense that God has acted in history in a way that is progressive and not in modern progressive, but it progresses, right? It progresses Mm -hmm. from uh, Abraham being a man to Israel being a people. Yep. From the temple being a building to the temple being... Christ people. You or know, the like, temple being a garden mm. to a temple being a building to a temple being the people. Yeah. To there being no temple. Right. Exactly. So yep. these types of things where we where we preach a passage and then we want you to see how it uh, is part of a larger narrative from Genesis to Revelation is not only an attempt to show you how beautiful the Bible is, but yep. to, to build your trust in the Bible. Yep. Like these the theme of uh, a blood sacrifice to cover sin is present in Genesis 3, mm-hmm. because there's clothing present An in animal Genesis that's 3, yep. and how do you get pelts? Mm-hmm. Well, you do the thing that Chris doesn't want to do with the fish, you <laughs> kill it, <laughs> okay. yeah, exactly. right? And so that's, you know, um, would you say that's that's pretty accurate as far as what you've been studying this summer, biblical theology? and? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just really, it, you know, it's a it's the thematic interpretation of Scripture, effectively, yeah. how is it held together? You know, it's, it's not, like you said, like systematics, where what does the Bible say about this, you know, particular issue, but how is the Bible held together by significant themes that help us make sense of the, the big picture of the whole story? So. so how did that tie into the life of the church aspect? Because your, mm-hmm. your doctorate is a, a, it's a more practical than a theoretical degree. That's applied theology. Right. Yeah. So what was maybe the emphasis of the class as far as taking the biblical theology as it is helpful for the life of the church? Yeah. I mean, the, so I would say that People have, you know, just like everybody's a theologian on some level, right? Everybody has beliefs, has beliefs about God, and however that shakes out, whether it's biblical or not, right. it's just a reality. Like everybody has beliefs about God. Um, so when it comes to the the biblical theology, everybody has an understanding of what the Bible is. How does the Bible fit together, right? Now, for most Christian people, the Bible does not fit together like a like a an actual puzzle that, you know, you see a big picture when it's all completed. The Bible is a disjointed document to a lot of people. Yeah. And so people will look a lot of times at the Old Testament and say, well, what happened here? When the New Testament was written, is that a, you know, did God change his attitude? Did he change his mind? Is Jesus, you know, different than than uh, what, you know, God was in the Old Testament, that kind of a thing? These are basic questions a lot of people ask. And so, you know, the the point of emphasis for biblical theology is effectively helping people understand, like, what what is it when you look at the Bible that you're taking from this document as a whole? Like, do you see this as a unified document? And, you know, for, I guess, the past probably 60, 70 years, at least in the evangelical church, uh, the, a particular, um, I guess, theological trend of what's called dispensationalism, mm-hmm. which you're aware of dispensationalism, but it's a way of interpreting the Bible that effectively looks at it in a much more disjointed capacity and seeing that, you know, God has different stories effectively for Jew and Gentile. There's a, um, you know, very much like uh, demarcations in terms of history, redemptive history. Um, you know, classic dispensationalism teaches that the Old Testament has no relevance for the Christian. These are things that uh, a lot of people grew up hearing potentially and didn't mm-hmm. even realize this is a school of thought. It's, yeah. it's you know, not 
even necessarily, I guess, dare to say, in natural reading of the Bible. It's something that was developed in the late 1800s by uh, a couple of guys who, uh, Schofield, Darby, moving on to, to Schaefer in the 20th century and so forth. So, so even if you don't know what dispensationalism is, if you have some sort of undercurrent that you were influenced by that devalues the Old Testament right. um, or tries to draw an incredibly sharp distinction between how God worked in the old versus worked in the new. Right. Then, or a view of the end times that's driven by dates, yeah. figures, graphs, charts, things like that. Yeah, that is birthed out of a reading, you said disjointed, you could right. say discontinuous. It's it's finding some sort of disjunction, some sort of chasm or break between yeah. old and new, whereas covenant theology, the, the tradition mm-hmm. that you and I are trained in, yeah. uh, is is trying as, as, as much as is appropriate to find continuation. Correct. You know, and that's really where biblical theology helps, is you're looking at Haggai, which I preached on, um, we're recording this on Monday, so I preached on Haggai yesterday. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a temple in the Old Covenant that gets destroyed during exile, and Mm -hmm. then the people are rebuilding the temple, and then God says the glory of this latter temple would be greater than the former. Yeah. But then Jesus comes, and Jesus says, when the temple's destroyed, I'll raise it up again in three days. Mm-hmm. And so you got to figure out like, how is the latter glory of the temple going to be greater than the former? Right. It's going to get destroyed. Right. And then he's resurrected a few mm-hmm. years later and his disciples go, Oh, he was talking about his body. Yeah. And then the end of the revelation says there is no temple. no temple. Right. And so you can either say, well, that's schizophrenic. Right. <laughs> I don't know if schizophrenic would be, I'm not trying to be, be too playful. There, sure. But like yeah. it's, that's disjointed. It's like, there's multiple personalities. Make up your mind, right? Yeah. yeah. This Bible has multiple personalities or, it is a progressive progression from a physical temple to God's dwelling in a person yeah. to then his dispensing, pun intended, of his spirit mm-hmm. to all who believe in him so that he now dwells in a people. Mm-hmm. And so when he returns, he fully dwells with his people such that there is no temple anymore because right. he's fully present. So that's a way to, to view the temple analogy and theme as a continuation rather mm-hmm. than a discontinuation where we got to figure out when a physical temple is going to be rebuilt. Yeah, and our dispensational friends, you know, very much value the literal interpretation of Scripture, which I, you know, I, that's that's fantastic for the most part. But there are certain passages that demand to be understood analogically and allegorically, you know. So when you see things like you know, Paul in Ephesians 5, where he talks about a, a man shall leave his father and mother, mm-hmm. the two, you know, will become one flesh, okay? That's something he says... This is referring to Christ in the church, yeah. right? So if if you take a, a look literally at Genesis and you see the the marriage pattern established, now yeah, for sure it's true that there is uh, this this union, this relationship that exists between a man and a wife uh, that you know brought together, husband and wife are one flesh. Mm-hmm. But Paul is saying there's something even greater than that. So you you don't need to devalue something that is, you know, literally right in front of you to value something that is an even bigger analogy. And so I think for a dispensational friends, they might focus so much heavily on, like, focus so heavily on the, the temple, uh, physical temple, that they lose sight of what's even greater than the temple. Mm-hmm. And that the temple, the real temple that we should be concerned with is the church, right, which is the body of Christ, Jesus raised from the dead, where in the new heavens and new earth, like you said, there will be no temple in that right. city, right? Because the lamb will be there. So um, we, we don't want to devalue, certainly, the things that are, you know, clear, laid out, you know, literal, okay, yes, the temple was built, and the temple was destroyed, and the temple gets rebuilt in the second temple period, but there's something more than that. That's yeah. not just another rebuilding of the temple. It's Jesus comes on the scene and everything centers on him. And really biblical theology at the end of the day uh, is Christ-centered theology. Yeah. It looks at Christ at the center and how does Christ help us understand like, okay, is the theme of temple just building, 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 or is there something that escalates in Christ? So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's fascinating discipline. You know, anybody who's listening and who knows me, feel free to ask me about it because it's uh, it's kind of kind of a fun thing it, to trace the these themes. On it in- new-ish, like the last few decades, there's really been the renewed emphasis on it? Um, I, I would say going back to the late 19th, early 20th century, you have like Gerhardus Voss yeah. and guys like that who, you know, did some pioneering work in this. But, um, you know, even before you go to some of the early church fathers and Augustine did a lot of things that would probably be considered biblical theology. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, he, he was an early writer and so didn't yeah. have the benefit of uh, having a lot of shoulders to stand on. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, as a discipline, as a recognized discipline in the academy, it's something that's really kind of, you know, sprung up over the past maybe 50 years or so, biblical yeah. theology has. But, um, you know, it's, it's certainly been a theme that the church has tried to identify the themes of 
of Scripture, um, you know, throughout the, the history of theology. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could ask a thousand more questions. Yeah, how about you, Josh? Um, what have I been doing, man? Too much. <laughs> Summer is that interesting beast where you're like, it's here and it's going to be amazing, and then you're wiped afterwards. Yeah, and um, summer in Wisconsin is so condensed to just a few months, yeah. and uh, I think for me it was not maybe the normal what summer is can is consisted of. I, I just took too many classes, and uh, you were was, pretty burned out. Just run you ragged, were pretty burned out. Yeah, I mean to the point where I was getting some headaches and stuff like that. So um, I think in my and, you know, I'm the oldest today that I've ever been, Chris. Yeah, same so here. When same I say here. in my old age, it's not because I'm elderly, but because <laughs> you know, I'm as old as I've ever been. And yeah, I think for the first time this summer, I felt the physical effects of doing too much. Hmm. For most of my life, I've been able to just kind of... Well, you got a walker this summer and a rascal suitor <laughs> and all that stuff, so yeah. Yeah, so I think I just... It was a lot of good things, um, some good classes. Uh, you, know, you mentioned the, the topic of suffering servant. I took a... Hebrew exegesis class, and we went through the Hebrew of... What is exegesis, Josh? Uh, the reading out of something. Hmm. Ex, out of. Um, so the reading out of, the, you know, we, we do exegesis and exposition every Sunday. We, What's the alternative to exegesis, Josh? Uh, eisegesis, the reading into. That's yeah. the type of thing We don't you, like that. No, you no. say, I think this means, and yeah. then you import your own meaning. Got some ideas, find some biblical text to back it up. No go, we don't yeah. do that. Yeah. So... Hebrew exegesis is is primarily concerned with looking at the original languages, and there's some really interesting stuff. You know, we talked about the Numbers passage. Moses is the most humble man. Is, is that Moses saying, I'm the most humble man? Well, there's exegetical reason in the original language to say it's he's the most humbled man, hmm. because Moses is constantly, as a suffering servant type, he's constantly around people that are causing him suffering, right. you know? And so, interesting things like that. Yeah. Um, I did get to go down to Orlando, which was disgusting in July. You just don't want to be. I mean, if you think it's hot in Wausau right now, it's gross. Like ninety. It is not a pleasant day outside right now. Um, yeah. And so, then I got back, did a bunch of schoolwork, and I just feel like I'm starting to recover from the summer. Where mm. Morgan and I got to go to Door County for a couple of days, and um, we got there, and we're like, let's just sit mm. around, <laughs> and it was glorious, just to slow down and have multiple moments where I thought. That was an hour? It felt like three hours. We mm. still have more hours, you know, and just to, <laughs> to really slow down the pace and sure. we had to sit out by the water. And that was really refreshing for us. And, you know, we're in toddler stage of life, so to have full conversations uninterrupted was nice. Uh, you got now, to be clear, you're not a toddler. Morgan's not a toddler. Yeah, yeah I revert sometimes. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it felt like we got to fit in a, a month's worth of conversations in two days yeah. and, and rekindle. And uh, so that was really good. And so I'm kind of coming off that and looking forward to the fall. Um, the kind of question of what have I been reading? The answer is too much. I'm trying to learn how to. Yeah. I'm even reading a book right now where um, it's a book about books, which for most of you, you're like, wow, how riveting is that? <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a book about, it's called Finding the Good Life Through Great Books. And the mm. idea is that... Uh, Human beings find virtue through, um, in part through like character studies. Okay. And so this this woman is taking different virtues like temperance mm -hmm. uh, or self control, and she's reading The Great Gatsby through the lens of that. Okay. So it's kind of interesting. But I have in my my I've had to slow myself down to not have the primary goal to be to race through the books to say that I've done I've been sure I'm finished reading it right. So it's kind of an interesting like. This book is about how literature is supposed to transform you, but I, I've been in a reading mode for so long that's like get through the book mm -hmm. that I I can't be transformed by the reading because I need to slow down enough to actually right. think about the so kind of a just reshaping of what is my reading time right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm reading that, it's a which I'm interested in because fiction is like something I want to get more into, particularly once my reading load is less. Um so that's been fun. Uh, comic books and stuff? No. Never going to be a comic books guy. If you're a comic books guy, great. Uh, not me. Josh so, will never be you. Yeah. I will never be you. What else have I been learning? Um, and I did, a, I did a Galatians course this summer, which was really fruitful. Galatians, for me, has never been a book that has jumped off the page. I've always preferred Ephesians or Colossians. Hmm. 
Um, Galatians has often felt to me a little stale, like, okay, we get it. You shouldn't get circumcised as your identity. Yeah, mm-hmm. like move on. Um, but being able to slowly go through the the Greek of Galatians over the course of like 20 hours, basically, mm-hmm. was really transformative for me because I saw how Galatians can be pretty repetitive. Mm-hmm. And if you see repetition as boring, then it's like, I want to move on. But if if we can understand why Paul has to repeat in so many different directions that you are justified in Christ alone and not through X, mm-hmm. we can realize how relentless our hearts are in justifying ourselves not in Christ, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, Paul is looking at this church and he says things like, I am astonished how quickly you have abandoned the one who called yeah. you in grace. And then in chapter three, he says, how foolish are you? Yeah. And are you this kind of foolish that having begun by the spirit, you're perfected in the flesh? And in so the words you- of Antoine Dodson from meme fame, you are so dumb. <laughs> you are really dumb. <laughs> and, and he says, are you this dumb? Yeah. Right? And so like, are you this foolish? And this is where I think the believer can really latch on to the beauty of Galatians and say, are you this foolish to think that God began your spiritual life by his spirit hmm. and you're going to complete it on your own? Yeah. And how often do I operate that way? Mm-hmm. How often do we operate that way? Where we're like, Quite okay, regularly. God started me up. He gave me a second chance and now it's up to me. Yep. It's like, no, God didn't begin by his spirit to have you perfect in your mm-hmm. flesh. God began by you his spirit. You are so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you are crucified in Christ, so now the life you live, you no longer live in the flesh, but you live by faith in the Son of God. And yeah. So I think for me, being able to slow down through that study of Galatians ministered me greatly. And, hmm. um, that's good. I find myself going back to that. Like, I love Galatians. Yeah. I love it. So yeah. uh, So that's that's kind of... It ma- makes me more spiritual than you, because I love that book. Oh, yeah, yeah You yeah, find yeah. it stale, Josh. So I don't find it stale anymore? Good. Good. You've learned. Well um, done. I find that about most books of the Bible, though, books that I, I'm not naturally drawn to. I wasn't naturally drawn to Revelation until I studied it deeply. Mm. Well, you just, I mean, you did a chunk in Ruth, right? Yeah. I mean, and so that's a book for me where I, I don't gravitate toward the book of Ruth. And, so good. And you found it riveting. Yeah, so Absolutely good. riveting. So, so good. Um, now I'm in a marriage counseling class, so I'm excited to really pivot and do a more practical ministry. Mm-hmm. You know, going from some deep language study to... Uh, how do we support marriages in the church? How do we have a lofty view of marriage and how it points us to the gospel? And and then how do we counsel? And so there's a, mm-hmm. I'm excited to do a more practical yeah. thing. Um, speaking of kind of the virtue character study in Wausau, we've been preaching through characters in the Bible. And the idea being that, you know, I'd often found, Chris, that I wanted people, <laughs> I wanted people to do something, mm-hmm. but I didn't know how to compel them to do it. And I always found this like manipulation. That's what yes, we're talking about. Yeah. Without manipulation, <laughs> right? And I found, and it, honestly, even found in myself, a lot of the things I do spiritually mm-hmm. are because I uh, I have a task to complete. I have a sermon sure. to preach. I have a Bible study to prepare for. I have a school assignment. So then I'm looking at most people in our church and going, well, if they if they're not getting grades for this. Mm-hmm. What's the compulsion? What's the and compulsion not in a manipulative way? Sure. But like, what's the the drive, the motivation, the, the drive to do yeah. anything, other than just saying, "Hey, obey." So, is this what's behind your plan to start giving grades to everybody at Downtown <laughs> Mission Church, Josh? So no, that people can show up and submit their work for the week and say, "Josh, here's what I've done. Here's no. what I." And you can say, "F," because I don't want to grade. <laughs> I joked like it, someone said, you know, you can you go to any any restaurant that used to not do tips, like a coffee shop, and they have like, oh. a tip button. And one like time, Arby's and stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's like you're doing the same exact work you did four years ago, but now I have to tip you. And uh-huh. I, someone was joking about doing that after services, and I was like, I don't want to see how little the tips are. <laughs> I, I just couldn't handle it when it's week after week tip, zero dollars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm working through this going, what, it, what is the just average Christian compulsion motivation mm-hmm. to do anything? other than fear of repercussions if, yeah. I, if I disobey. And uh, I think one of the places I landed was that we tend to be changed not only through so propositions or precepts, like do this, um, or statements, mm-hmm. um, but we tend to be changed by stories. 
know, and God's given us mm. a book of stories. It's like forty-five percent narrative, I think the Bible sure. is. And we're changed as we see Jesus interact with so and so. We're changed as he invites Zacchaeus. Sure. He invites himself to see. Right. Himself. <laughs> we're we're changed as we view these stories, and I think to some degree it's like a we're not expecting to be changed, mm-hmm. but we're captivated by the faithfulness or whatever. So we've been doing that in Wausau and just seeing how how was Daniel faithful, how was Ruth faithful, all these different things. So that's been fun. Um, that's what I've been preaching. Um, yeah, so in the remaining like three minutes, four minutes, uh, I just was, you know, we are a time to think. And so I thought our last question as we do this kind of catching up to yep. speed. Chris, when you find yourself thinking, you're not mm-hmm. prepping for a sermon, you're not leading a Bible study, you're not... Uh, working on schoolwork, where's your mind go these days? What are you thinking about? I don't know. That's a good question for me, <laughs> and I, I just mean because I, I I have a I have a unique brain system, um, you know, in in part because of my you're a my neurology. Yeah, but uh, no, I mean I I think about everything. Like I I really do think about everything. But um, no, I mean I I would say um, with any focused thought I, I think politics I've thought quite a bit about this summer um, you know and, and you know and other people know my my undergraduate work was was all done in, in government and political science yeah. public administration and stuff so you know I, I have that that bone in my body still um, and it's been you know I guess a wild An summer intriguing summer. <laughs> yeah it's yeah. been a wild summer and, and so um, you know I, I think our, our country is on the precipice of another four-year period that's going to be very you know, it'll be defined by the the leader that is yeah. you know elected at that point, and and so you know I think it's it's just a you know, I guess something that I'm I'm looking at with great curiosity right now because I think at at some point you realize you can vote and then it's hands off you know mm-hmm. like you can't you can't make people vote the way you want them to and uh, you can't cast votes for other people that's illegal at least you should not do that. Um, don't do those things. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've thought a fair amount about that, and and uh, you know, my kids are starting to get involved in politics, and my daughter's volunteered at something at a at a um, I guess a party party meeting yesterday um, with with Rosalie. So they're they're trying to get active with some things, and I guess just you know they're growing up, and that's yeah. that. But uh, on more fun, a more fun theme for me has been football. So. Yeah, you know, and something exciting for all of you to know is is Josh is now back in the world of fantasy football. Yeah, and uh, I've been well, waiting years for, for I was, this. I was hoping to go from you thinking about you know the, the state of our country <laughs> to me thinking about football, but you had a beautiful segue there. So yeah. in the Stark. No, no, and it's it's great because I'm wanting you to play fantasy for a good few years now, and and so it's great. You were at our draft party the other day, and and that was a good time, and had a lot of good barbecue. And uh, some desserts that are wonderful and and everything. So yeah, talk to us about football, Josh. I've been thinking about football. Um, you know, I'm as maybe I don't know as maybe playful as I can seem. There's my microphone. If you just had a bad noise, sorry, I knocked it. Uh, <laughs> as maybe playful as I can seem, I I do struggle to play. I struggle to not be severe. I, I tend <laughs> to think deeply and uh you know and angrily you think angrily (laughs) self-righteously would be maybe (laughs) anger is born out of self-righteousness no uh i mean i i think and that's part of like being a young parent you're learning a new you want to do parenting well you're in seminary you want to do that well still it's still Mm -hmm. in a developmental process honestly as a church and uh as a pastor is what Mm -hmm. i mean like a lot of times people say you don't really feel comfortable in a job for like five years. Sure. So I'm at year four and a half. Mm-hmm. So like this, is a, a lot of my life is developmental right now. Yeah. And so I can struggle to remove myself from that. Um, and my background being in sports, sports used to be all I thought about. Yeah. And then I took like three or four years off. Um, and it's been fun to just play a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So I, in, in the midst of a really busy summer in the past month, I have enjoyed um, reading more sports articles and have, uh, Used my renewed interest in sports to issue a challenge to the church to watch football together. Yes, um, and to uh, really to share experiences. I mm-hmm. think that's that's something that I'm eager to do this fall. Is uh, I know in myself if I watch a game by myself, I'm prone to getting really tense. Sure, 
I'm prone to being upset if I'm interrupted. Mm-hmm. But if I'm watching a game with others, like... Are you eating M&M's, hanging out in somebody's yeah. basement? That's Even fun. Even a Titans yeah. loss is palatable if I've got yeah. friends around. And so I'm eager to just share some experiences with people and um, feel like I have a little bit more freedom in my schedule these days to do that. So that's exciting. Um, and... Yeah, that's what I find myself thinking about on my off time. Otherwise, the marriage counseling class is probably the yeah. the more professional thing that, that I think about these days. Hmm. Um, and on our next episode, we'll kind of combine forces to talk about something we've talked about behind the scenes. We were going to talk about canon. I still think I'd like to do something about that at some point as an evangelist. We're talking about our lifting routines, Josh? Yes. And canons? No. Okay. Um, talking about biblical canon, why we can trust the old book that we have. Yep. Uh, but as we were talking, Chris, in the past couple weeks, just thinking that there's a different topic we'd like to discuss first, and that's the topic of revival. Mm. So um, we've been... Loaded word. Yes. You should stay tuned, all of you, to find out what it really means. So the next time we, we convene for a time to think, we're going to be talking about revival, and probably for a number of episodes, looking at what it means to be a church that believes in revival, prays for it. Um, and guards against false revival. Yeah. So until then, this has been a time to catch up, a time to do a little bit of thinking. We talked about biblical theology. Yeah, you had to have thought to uh, listen to us. I mean, Hopefully you laughed. Maybe you cried a little bit when you're laughing at us. Perhaps and, you gagged. Uh, gross. <laughs> this has been a time to think. All right.